My name is Maiko. I'm the founder and president of Nexus Motion. Nexus Motion was created because of my passion for sharing the knowledge about the human movement system and also connecting movement professionals from around the world. This is the first video interview that I'm doing with uh, much inspiration coming from listening to podcasts like The Tim Ferriss Show. And uh, I am very, very excited and honored to have my mentor and my friend, Dr. Shirley Sarman. Um, the purpose of this interview is to try to dig into what makes Shirley a world-class physical therapist and for everyone around the world to uh, get to know Shirley on a more personal level. Uh, Dr. Shirley Sarman uh, is a faculty emeritus from the program in physical therapy at Washington University in St. Louis, which is where I fortunately went to school to become a physical therapist. Now, it's, uh, it's a little hard to say that she is retired <laughs> because uh, even after her retirement in 2012, she's still traveling all over the world to teach movement system impairment syndromes and giving keynote speeches at conferences and educating not just physios around the world, but the physicians and the public as well. Now, she became a Catherine Worthingham Fellow of APTA in 1986. And in 1998, she was awarded the Mary McMillan Award from the APTA, which is the highest honor of the association. Now, her two textbooks, The Diagnosis and Treatment of Movement Impairment Syndromes and The Movement System Impairment Syndromes of the Cervical Spine, Thoracic Spine, and the Extremities, have been translated into at least seven languages. Now, she's been influencing many physical therapists and movement professionals around the world to optimize people's movements. In fact, uh, Shirley is in the middle of teaching the four-day MSI seminar here in Los Angeles, and uh, we've got about 40 people from Japan with us to learn from her. Well, Shirley, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Uh, I understand that uh, you may have answered some of these uh, this evening's questions uh, in your previous interviews, podcasts, and such. However, this interview I plan to subtitle for my Japanese movement colleagues, so I hope you don't mind that some of the repeat questions are... Uh, and, yeah, and some questions are from the LA Movement System Seminar participants, and uh, some are from me. So we'll just get right into it. Uh, could could you tell us why did you become a physical therapist? So when I was uh, growing up and was in high school, it was the peak of the polio epidemic. And so there were a lot of paralyzed little children. I uh, always liked being very physically active, even though it wasn't the way people were supposed to be, not women anyway, in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. uh, but I thought that would be a great thing to do, is to help little paralyzed children be able to be active again. Mm -hmm. So it, it was um, sort of that motivation that sent me to, to uh, I didn't really go directly to physical therapy school. I, uh, if you want the whole real story, I uh, started off at Washington University. At that time, physical therapy was a two-year program. And I uh, actually wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I was actually considering physical education as a major and physical therapy and other things. And then in 19, so I started, uh, the university in 1954, mm -hmm. before your parents were born, and uh, in 1956, I had a brother who was 15 months younger than I, and he was accidentally killed, and um, his death was one that motivated me to do something that might be worthwhile with my life. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, physical therapy might be something where I could help people, and that would be making my life more worthwhile. So the combination of thinking about polio, paralyzed children, my brother's death, I thought, do something worthwhile, Shirley. And so I went, I decided to go into physical therapy school. 
In those days, if you could walk and talk at the same time, you could get into physical therapy school. <laughs> so I, I could. I could walk and talk at the same time, so I got into physical therapy school. And there were 18 students in my class. Mm -hmm. So it was a very small thing that, that I did at that time. Okay. So that's what motivated me. I see. All right. Well, we're, we're getting a feel for the little history. Yes. Uh, can you share with us a little brief history of physical therapy from your perspective? And it, so it, at that time, when I went into physical therapy, um, it, it was, again, the idea that you might help people that were sort of paralyzed. And I really thought I didn't know need to know that much, just not enough to be dangerous. <laughs> and... Um, mm -hmm. In, in many ways, when I got my first job, I sort of felt like a medical cheerleader. Like, come on, you can do it, let's take a step, I'm going to help you, etc. I didn't feel like I had to figure out anything, I just had to help people be strong enough to help pick them up, and carry them along. Mm -hmm. And uh, at, at that time, too, the, the polio vaccine had been introduced, and so we were beginning to lose the polio patient, but we were getting more, they were saving the lives of the head injured and the spinal cord injured before this, those people just died. Mm -hmm. So it was very much a neurological population of people. But what was really tricky for me is because these head injured, spinal cord injured stroke patients had upper motor neuron problems, mm -hmm. central nervous system problems, and the polio patient had a lower motor neuron problem, that we've got caught in this transition between how do you treat the polio patient differently than you treat the neurological central nervous system lesion mm -hmm. patient. And with the polio patient, it was all about stretching muscles. It was all about getting muscles to respond again. And so we did, and we did resistive exercise and muscle re-education. But with a neurological patient, we were supposed to not stretch a muscle because we'd make the spasticity worse. We were not to strengthen them because it would make their spastic muscles stronger. Mm -hmm. So it was a real problem of, I don't understand what I'm doing because it doesn't apply to this patient. It doesn't seem to what I did for that other patient. Sure. So we were in, caught in a real transition at that time as to what do I really do. Mm. Um, but because I'm so smart, after nine years, I decided I really don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> but I'm a little slow on the uptake. So um, I, I, I was very lucky because patients would stay in the hospital forever. I mean, they, mm. they, they, they stay there a long time. So I, I got to watch how people worked, and I was trying to figure out what was uh, happening with these patients. And uh, it didn't matter what I tried, I didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. So I decided that the only way to, to deal with this situation is to escape by going to graduate school. Escape. <laughs> so then I didn't have to know what I was doing. I could go to graduate school and try and figure out what All I was right. doing. Sounds good. So, so that's what I did nine years later. Mm -hmm. Wow. Now, I, I understand that you used to do uh, research, uh, recording uh, from the mor motor co cortex of monkeys. Uh, what led you to shift from the neurology area into now orthopedics? You know, I'd, I'd love for people to know the origin story of MSI. <laughs> okay, so, um, so I, because again, I was uh, so smart, it only took me seven years to get my PhD. <laughs> and at that time, uh, my PhD work was, was looking actually uh, at, at, at cats and motor patterns. And then when I uh, graduated, I, I've, I've always been like the thing that has been so fortuitous for me, I've always been in the right place at the right time. Uh, and, and that's really the truth. So just to back up for a minute, when I decided I needed to go to graduate school, I, uh, they were just starting this PhD program in neurobiology. Mm -hmm. And 
uh, I, I, so I just went to the person that was in charge of that program and I said, I want to go to graduate school. He didn't look at my academic record. He just said, you need to find an advisor. Okay. And, and so if, if, to, to get the real story, so I had a, a fourth cousin who was 16 years old and had a stroke. Mm -hmm. I was working with him and his neurologist argued with me about how I should manage my cousin. <laughs> and so we had this argument. And my cousin did really well. Now I know it was luck, not me. But the neurologist was so impressed that I had argued with him <laughs> about his stroke because he loved to, to argue. So when I wanted a, an advisor, I went to this neurologist. And he had just been to a big conference where the Bobas and the Brunstroms and all that were trying to explain how to treat neurological patients. And he said they were just full of nonsense. Mm. So when I went to say, I want to work with you, he said, well, somebody's got to straighten you physical therapist out. <laughs> so he took me on as a graduate student. And what is the name of this neurologist? His name is William Landau. Yes. And, um, <laughs> and as fate would have it, his major research assistant was a woman that had been a physical therapist. Fantastic. Fantastic. So she said, oh, I'll, I'll be happy to help you. Okay. So he turned me over to her. And we spent seven years. I, I, I always like to tell the story. I had such severe cerebral atrophy because I had been out of school for nine years <laughs> that when I started graduate school and I, I all of a sudden was in biochemistry and they're talking about esters and ethyls and I'm thinking of all the girls I went to school with. <laughs> Nothing about chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> That's too cute. Oh, it was too. That's it was too, too true. Mm -hmm. It was too true. So anyway, the the so it took me a while to get my my brain in gear again, but they were very patient with me, and uh, as it turned out, I I did fairly well, and I got out of my I got my PhD in neurobiology, and then uh, I was so lucky that Bill Landau hired me because they were looking for someone to teach the basic sciences to OTs and PTs. Mm -hmm. So I got that job, and so I was half-time in, in PT, OT, and I was half-time in the Department of Neurology. Oh, wow. And Bill Landau, this neurologist, always was interested in the upper motor neuron syndrome, as was I. Mm -hmm. Why, what is the disordered motor control of people with central nervous system lesions? Sure. So that's why we did the monkey business. The monkey business. It was a monkey yes, business. The infamous monkey business. So we got monkeys and we trained them to do tasks with their foot. Okay. And while they did those tasks, we recorded from their motor cortex. Believe it or not, I spent 19 years training monkeys. That's a long time. Yes, it was. And I'm not sure that I got any better when I started working with people again. <laughs> so, so the monkeys did this task, and then what we would we would record from their motor cortex, and then we would put a lesion in their pyramidal tract to see how they reorganized themselves. I did not push back any frontiers of ignorance mm -hmm. with that, but I was learning a whole lot about the nervous system, and. And so that learning about the nervous system, my previous experience for nine years working with neurological patients, mm -hmm. and then I'd always had this overriding interest in why, why do people move the way they move? For example, how can you recognize somebody at a distance by how they move before you see their face? Mm -hmm. We studied normal gait, and if everybody had a normal gait, it ought to look the same. Mm -hmm. But people don't look the same. And then you make impressions about people based on how they move. Sure. And so I wanted to know, sort of like, what is it that make people move the way they move? The other thing is, when I was seeing patients, I could never understand why some people who would run marathons had no calluses on the bottom of their feet, and other people had so many calluses, I don't know how they got their shoes on. <laughs> I'm serious. So what were these differences in, in people in the way they moved if there was sort of a normal way to do things. So sort of that over, so I was always observing people, mm -hmm. trying to put the pieces together. And then um, when um, Steve Rose 
came to Washington University to, to be director of the physical therapy service, he, he asked me to take a look at patients that had back pain and musculoskeletal pain with them. And, um, and I kind of saw that they weren't moving right. <laughs> and in those days, that if you had a patient with musculoskeletal pain, it, you were supposed to stretch muscles and strengthen muscles. But since I didn't think they were moving right, I just started having them move differently. Mm -hmm. And I did the same exam on them that I did on my patients with stroke. Okay. <laughs> and they, like, got better. And I, like, didn't know why. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that sort of led me on to redo part of what I had learned from muscle testing, muscle length assessment. The, the Putting people in quadruped was a big part of the treatment of neurological patients at the time, because we thought we were retraining the brain. In quadruped. <laughs> taking, in quadruped, because we were taking them through their developmental sequence again. See. <laughs> I, I Even then, I knew that wasn't true, <laughs> because their heads were small and their bodies were big. And when you're a baby, your head is big and your body's small. Mm. It's, it's not the same. So anyway, I, I, uh, I always thought there was something mechanical about it. Mm. So I was doing those same tests with people that had uh, musculoskeletal pain, and as I say, and I was teaching them how to walk differently, teaching them how to move, and they, and they got better. So that's, <clears throat> that led me on to trying to do a very specific test to look at muscle length, et cetera, to see how that played into these movement yeah. patterns. Okay. So that's how the MSI business got started. Fantastic. I know. Fantastic. But in the end, uh, a, a a physical therapist specialized in neurology and orthopedics. I mean, I, it, we're all kind of doing the same thing. They were? They weren't. No, it, they it, weren't, but now it seems like we're all focused yes, on... Yes, so, so historically, what the only other person that was uh, paying attention to um, neurology things in patients that had musculoskeletal pain was a man by the name, a physician from Czechoslovakia by the name of Yanda. And he had actually gotten to Australia and was trying to um, get people to think about neurological aspects. Mm -hmm. But he thought if you had a musculoskeletal pain problem, you were sort of a minor cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. That if you didn't move right, it because because you had a, bit, a brain lesion. Mm -hmm. And he really he was a physician, and he also didn't understand anatomy and kinesiology very well. <laughs> and so. But he was someone that talked about sort of the nervous system in musculoskeletal pain. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when when I started talking about those similar kinds of things, it, it created more interest. Sure. Yeah. Now, uh, the next couple questions are from the participants from this seminar. Oh, okay, good. Uh, what are some concerns you have encountered as a physical therapist? You, you know, I, I think... Um, so as I've grown up in this in this profession where when I first started, physicians told us very specifically what to do. I mean, like, I was to use a certain director for a microtherm at 20 inches for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Part of why I, I was interested in neurological patients is nobody could tell you what to do because nobody knew. <laughs> but with musculoskeletal pain, they tried to tell you, do Williams flexion exercises. Mm -hmm stretch this muscle, um, put this modality on. And at, at the time, I didn't know the difference between, between treating symptoms and understanding the cause of a problem. Mm -hmm. So what, what is my biggest concern is now through these 60-odd years of watching physical therapy, as I told you, I, I got a baccalaureate degree. Mm -hmm. Now, in the U.S., people go to school for seven years. They get a clinical doctorate degree. Mm -hmm. is, the, is the failure to understand how many things we figure out. Even in the old days, that there, used, there are these physicians called physiatrists or doctors of physical medicine. Mm -hmm. And they were supposed to be the doctors to tell us what to do. Because physical therapy was considered... It's like you go to a pharmacy and you get pills. You go to physical therapy and you get a modality to help you with your symptoms mm -hmm. or to take people through exercises yeah. without people understanding how complicated those are. Mm 
Sure so, so my biggest problem right now, my biggest concern is that there's not enough respect for how smart and how much physical therapists understand. Mm -hmm. uh, and so therefore, we're, we're not, what we do is not seen for the value that we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand that. Now, on the other hand, what gets you really excited or happy about being a physical therapist? What gets me really excited about, and you can tell from when I teach these courses or do this, is, is helping people to understand how the way they move causes their problem. Mm -hmm. And that it's simple little things that they need to change that can stop them from getting musculoskeletal pain. Mm -hmm. And so what we have to offer is so amazing. And, and you know, if you read the paper or you read magazines, that there is no pill that's as effective as exercise. Mm -hmm. That if, if it came in a pill, we'd be on it three times a day. Mm -hmm. And yet there's little appreciation for one, that people really need to do this, and number two, for how complex it is. And so that uh, I get excited in helping smart people learn how they can make little changes to help people move on with their lives without having musculoskeletal pain. Uh, as you know, in this country, we've got this big problem with opiates, mm -hmm. opiate addiction. And I say it's because physicians are forced to treat symptoms are the consequences of destroying tissues while we could treat cause. And we could teach people how what they do causes them to pain. Now, how much better could this be? How, how could I not be excited about what, what we do? Absolutely. Yeah. Which is I'm all after, I, I, I've only been a, uh, out of school for only 12 years, and there's not a day that goes by that I wake up, and I, I never feel like, oh, i got to go to work, because you know, I've got people to go help you know, each day. So. Now, another question from the participants. Uh, what ideal qualities make an excellent physical therapist? I, I, I think the qualities are always trying to understand what it is you're doing. Like, what really is this underlying condition of the patient? Mm -hmm. And what am I doing to understand that condition? And how is it that what I do affects that condition? So, uh, and, and I know there's these little personal things. I was thinking about that is that when I was growing up, my father loved to teach. He was an electrician. That's why I've got all these toys. Oh, And so uh, all my family were electricians. But happily in those days, a woman couldn't become an electrician, or I might have been an electrician. That's why I studied neurobiology, so I could be an electrician of the nervous system. <laughs> <laughs> now, was it just a gender... Uh, yeah, women, of, women couldn't it, do it that. It just wasn't... For, it wasn't yeah. possible. It wasn't allowed. Which turned out to be good for me, but anyway. Um, I'm very grateful that you did not become an electrician. Yeah, me too. Um, <laughs> but but my father was always wanting, he, he would never say, okay, uh, and, and also in my family, girls didn't do one thing and boys did another. I, I, had to, I had to be able to repair a car before he would let me drive. I mean, it was like, you either know how to fix it or you don't drive it. And everything was about teaching you to understand what went on. So I think, I think that's all part of what happened to me. It was always I wanted to understand what I was doing. Okay. And, and so I think that the quality of does it really make sense, do you really understand, is what, what has made me think about all these things. Yeah, fantastic. And then I was so smart that I got other people that were smarter than I am to help me understand. <laughs> It's always great to have a, a team of people surrounding you. To, well, that was that, to, that's what I've also done nature. really well. Yeah. Now uh, you're going to be turning 80 years old shortly. You're trying to remind me. Is I that was... it? <laughs> <laughs> the wheelchair's waiting out there. Uh, no, 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 no. Um, what advice would you give to your 40-year-old self? <laughs> to my 40-year-old self? Yes. Well, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, Again, you know, my enthusiasm for what I'm doing, or was always doing, my commitment to trying to understand better, to share my enthusiasm for what I was doing, engaging colleagues who were smarter than I was, 
-hmm. and having them help me figure out things, respecting people. Uh, it's, it's kind of like you, you assembled a choir that all were singing the same songs, but they only joined because they also wanted to participate. Mm -hmm. So I think I think what I've been so lucky about, I've never, like you, I've never felt like, oh, I got to go to work today. I like, mm -hmm. I can't wait to get there. I can't wait to do what I'm doing next, both with the patients, with the students, with my colleagues. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've always been somebody that was always half full. You know, a, a Pollyanna, I've never been like, it's half empty. I've mm -hmm. always been, it's always half full. Yeah. Yep. So I'd say stay half full. <laughs> always, always. Now, uh, what's been the uh, most exciting finding for you in the literature recently? You know, I know you're always, I mean, you've just got this naturally curious mind. You're always reading, thinking why, and, you know, up to uh, the the newest research. <laughs> well, it, well, to be perfectly, to be really perfectly honest, I, I, I'm just so keen about the research that Linda Van Dillen's doing mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm much more excited about the research that's coming out of our own place than I am the, the other research that I, that I read. Mm -hmm. um, Mainly because I know how thoroughly she 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 does her work, uh, and then she's so smart she consults me, <laughs> and and she's really working away, chipping away at you know sort of the the books that you mentioned and and this little model is those are all theories, and I and, and what Linda's been doing is I call it she's separating fact from fiction, mm -hmm. and helping us to understand better. So I, I think the compilation of all of the research that she's done, all the research that she's in progress and, and that she's planning, to, to me are like the most exciting things. And we can go to the flip side because one of the papers that was just published was how... You've told me about this, I think. The one by Tony? Yes. Yes. Yep. So the, the flip side is what research isn't helpful? Mm -hmm. And so there was a paper that got a lot of publicity out in the real world that showed that yoga was not inferior to physical therapy. Now that's a problem. And so one of the other things is when you're reading the literature, what are the good, and just because it's in the literature doesn't mean it's, it's a good study. Mm -hmm. And um, what, one of the things that uh, about this paper is it was a specific approach to low back pain. Mm -hmm. And I considered the kind of exercises that people were given for this were not very appropriate. Mm -hmm. So the bad thing for us as physical therapists is when you read a, a paper and it says physical therapy isn't any better than yoga, it's like ph physical therapy is a generic entity. That's like saying pills are no better than uh, hot packs. Mm -hmm. What pills? For what conditions? And so one of, one of the things that's a problem is, is physical therapy is not differentiated into what kind of approach was used for that physical therapy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that needs to happen better, yeah. is, is differentiating. Is this a treatment-based program? Is this a manipulative therapy program? Mm -hmm. Is this an exercise program? All physical therapy is not created equal. And so I think that's one of our problems. Right. Now, uh, what do you hope for the future of physical therapy? <laughs> well, you, you've heard this so many times, but I'll repeat it for the, Please. the thing. I, it, it, if, if all goes well, that for physical therapy, we will be seen as experts in the movement system. And, and the movement system is all those physiological systems that combine to make us move the way we do. And that people will understand that's a body system, just like the metabolic system, the immune system. And of course, inflammation, as you probably all know now, is like the really key thing that everybody's looking at. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what seems to be the underlying cause of all the problems, mm -hmm. is the infl inflammatory system. And the immune system is part of what takes care of that. Okay, 
that so number one they'll understand that physical therapists take uh, take care of this system mm -hmm. and in contrast to like the nervous system with the movement system we would have a role in helping children develop an optimal movement system are, what are their structural variations? I mean, and we know if they're Japanese, they don't have any hip medial rotation. Clearly. We know they have no lumbar curve. <laughs> <laughs> that there are all these issues yep. with different groups. So we would say about these are the things you got to watch because you come with various structural variations. That we would make sure that children can control their fundamentals of movement so that when they do the big sports activities, they're doing it with an, oper an optimal operating movement system. Yeah. We would know that they have adequate strength, adequate aerobic endurance, and we would help to shape these. Yearly, people would come in. Yeah. And my analogy, as you know, is like we go to a dentist in this country mm -hmm. twice a year, we spend thousands of dollars to have our teeth straight, and they barely show. <laughs> and people don't appreciate how important it is to have good alignment, mm -hmm. but it's critically important because that's the way your body operates. So I'm hoping that we will have lifespan practice, that we will see patients yearly. They will come in, that we will have diagnostic categories so that people know we figure something out. No one will ever know we figure anything out until you put a label on it. So we've got to get used to putting these labels on conditions so people know that we, we figure things out. That people will consider us exercise experts, not the ones that are just saying, let's do biceps curls or let's do this, but here's the, what this particular body needs and you're doing it right. You can go to your personal trainer, they can help you with your program, but these are the criteria for your particular body. Let's come back later if you decide to take up a sport. Let's come in and see whether you're set to do that sport or not. Mm -hmm. So I, I would see us as consultants doing these things. I would like us tied up with gyms, fitness places, so that if people go in and work out, we can make sure that they're really doing everything correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my that's my big big vision for what the profession would be about. Great. Now, um, to make those things happen, mm -hmm. do, do you have current goals that you're working on? Not, not that you're retired. <laughs> do I have current goals? Yeah. Yeah, to get like little smart <laughs> people like you to get Japanese physical therapists mm -hmm. interested and mm -hmm. to run courses and to get a lot of people trying to spread the word and yeah. gaining the expertise. Those That's are right. my goals. To live long enough to see a little bit. Yep. <laughs> now, I hope that's for many years to come. Now, too, uh, you've mentioned in our past conversations that instead of physical therapist, yeah. that you'd prefer a different professional name. I just thought this was so cute. I, I think you'd said, how about, Michael, moveologist? And, uh, now, why do you think that physical therapist, the, the phrase physical therapist doesn't do justice as our professional label? Well, I, ha I have to tell you first about what my initial suggestion was. Okay, yeah. And I thought we should be morticians, but people thought that was too close to morticians. That's terrible. And that would be terrible. That's terrible. I was trying to play on the idea that you have physicians. So if we were morticians, mm -hmm. we could be like physicians. But I, I've given that one up. Okay. <laughs> so um, here's the reason, is that if you're a therapist, somebody else figures out the problem and you deliver the therapy. Mm -hmm. In the speech therapy world, they're no longer speech therapists, they're speech pathologists. So uh, they've taken away that label of therapist, which is a deliver of therapy mm -hmm. and not a figure outer of the problem. Uh -huh. So my, my, my big belief is that if we change it, change our title to moveologist, it will connote that we study movement, mm -hmm that we have expertise in that system and we won't be labeled therapist. Mm -hmm. And I think there would be huge advantages to do that. I know like in different countries, I was, I don't know exactly what it's like in Japan, but in, um, in Italy and in Germany, if a, a person goes to a physical therapist, they expect a massage. Uh -huh. That goes with being a therapist. Mm -hmm. 
if they, many of these countries, they become osteopaths because an osteopath doesn't give a massage. <laughs> so they can go to that osteopath that's a, really a physical therapist or a physiotherapist and not expect a massage. So you have certain expectations because of the history of the profession that are a handicap to us. Mm -hmm. And so if we change our title, now some people in the past wanted to call us um, kinesiopathologist. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to be stuck with pathology because we could do so much for prevention. And if you're a pathologist, you're only dealing with existing pathology. And that kind of rules out the preventive part of things. That's right. You've uh, said many times here at the seminar, too, to it doesn't make sense for us to wait till something becomes a problem. Let's keep everybody optimally moving. Yes, so. I, I, I'm in this category of there are signs before there are symptoms. Mm -hmm. And I equate that with when your blood sugar goes high, you have the metabolic syndrome, or your cholesterol's high. I don't want to wait for the stroke. I don't want to mm -hmm. wait for the heart attack. I, I want to optimize living so yeah. that I minimize the consequences right. or put them off for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it got me thinking so much the moveologist, or I did remember about the motician too. And I said, <laughs> what do you think about movementologist? Or what? Movementologist. Movementologist. I, I don't. I don't know. It's it's, it's a little long. It's I don't a little care. Long. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not totally committed to one term. I'm I'm open to yeah. hearing other things, but mm -hmm. it'll sort sure. itself out. As you can, uh, we've got a big crowd here just watching us. Uh, you've got a lot of fans from Japan, including myself. Well, thank you. Uh, they'd like to know your honest opinions about Japanese physical therapists, the the good and the bad. You know, what's the, what? What do you think to you? What feels different about U.S. and Japanese physical therapists? Beside no lumbar curve. Beside no lumbar <laughs> curve. And no gluteals. And no gluteals. And no pec major. And apparently. no pec major. I mean, it's, I don't know. Uh, no, it, you know, um, I, I think what I've, I've so enjoyed about uh, my opportunities to, to teach and lecture with the Japanese physical therapist is they're so committed to understanding. You, you all are so responsive. I mean, you even laugh at my bad jokes. Uh, I, I really, I really appreci appreciate the, the commitment, the enthusiasm, uh, the sort of working hard while we're doing lab, uh, lab things. So uh, I, I, I think, I think you're also very committed to trying to learn. Mm -hmm. I, I think you're all very, com very competitive, and so you want to know as much as anybody else knows, and I think that's a really, really good thing. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's what I really enjoy, your, your sense of humor, your sense of play, your commitment, mm -hmm. your hard work. All right. There isn't much more than that. <laughs> Thank you. Now, um, we've talked a little bit about gadgets, but what makes you <laughs> so interested in technology and electronic gadgets? I mean, I, I don't know too many people who's in their 70s uh, that have so many things on, on their body, just monitoring everything. <laughs> It reminds me one of my funny stories. I was sitting in an airline club, and I had my headset on. I was working on a computer. I was doing a number of other things, and a man actually came up to me. He said, you're pretty good for an old lady. <laughs> <laughs> he said, my mother couldn't do that. Oh. Well, it, it's the little thing I mentioned before. My, my father, all of my family were electricians. Yes. And uh, so things that were electrical, gadgets, just seemed like, we, we had a TV before anybody else. Mm -hmm. We had an ele a, a electric dishwasher before anybody else. And so it just seemed part of the family tradition mm -hmm. to try to get the toys. And then there's this expression that he who has the most toys when he dies wins. <laughs> so I'm <laughs> counting on winning. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Now, what is your current favorite toy? Oh, my gosh. Oh... Well, you know, it would be hard to say that, that your, your cell phone isn't like, because you can do so, so many things with it. Mm -hmm. But I'm also um, uh, so worried about backup, so I have two cell phones. <laughs> and I have two watches, and I love having a GPS on the watch because it tells me 
not only where I've gone, because I can have a map of it, but uh -huh. it also tells me the intense, does my heart rate, and tells me the intensity of my activity yes. and how high my, the altitude I go up. Because one of the things that seems important for your health as you age is having some intensity of, mm -hmm. uh, of exercise. So I like all these toys that tell me where I've been, mm -hmm. <laughs> how hard I've worked, yes. and, and then I say I've really worked hard today because my watch is telling me that. Yep. So I like them all. Perfect. Now, uh, you seem uh, like very data-driven. <laughs> now, is, is there a secret to having a curious mind? I mean, I think you just kind of naturally came into this world thinking, oh, why, why, do this, why does this happen? Why? And uh, I, I know, do some, pe some people born to think like scientists, or can someone develop a mind that consistently asks the why questions? Well, I, I, there, there are actually two aspects to this. I, I, I sort of told you, told you that from my earliest days of growing up, my father was always like, why is this happening? Do you mm -hmm. understand what you're doing? It was never like, just do this. Mm -hmm. Do you understand how a car works? Can you fix it? Yeah. Do, if you're using a hammer, why do you want to hold it down here rather than up close to the head? So mm -hmm. it, it was just built into me to always think about mm -hmm. why. Uh, and we were always going out on construction jobs and Etc. Okay. So, but the one thing where I was a failure mm -hmm. is that I don't have enough OCD, <laughs> obsessive compulsive disorder, mm -hmm. and that's why Linda has been so good. So I can easily jump on to the next toy or project without hanging in there to work on the details okay. as well, and so. Uh, my, I have to fess up, my, my research abilities were not nearly as great as Linda. Mm -hmm. I mean, because she can work over those details, just time and time again, eking it out, eking it out, and I have to kind of do it on a long haul. I like putting a theory out there and working it out, mm -hmm. but Linda ham hammers away. So I think there's one thing to asking why, but there's another thing to hanging in there, looking for the details with great commitment and I'm strong on one and weak on the other. I think that's why I, I like uh, sticking to being a clinician and maybe an educator as opposed to being a researcher because I, I, I get quite impatient. So I think it takes a, you have to be yep. very patient to be in the long haul. Yeah, you know, and I sort of, in some ways I sort of knew I, I needed to go uh, it, it back to school rather than just working as a clinician because it was clear to me I was more interested in the patient in trying to understand their problem than I was in the patient. Mm -hmm. And so like when you get to the point where you're, I do want the patient to get better, but I was really more interested in understanding the problem. And, and that sort of pushed me into like, well, you better go get a formal way mm -hmm. of, of studying mm -hmm. this. Yeah. Do you have a favorite motto? Motto? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, my new motto. <laughs> My, my current motto, because this is sort of the way it works out over time, is no good deed goes unpunished. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think one of, the, one of the trickiest things in life, for example, in this country, we, uh, back in 1965, developed Medicare. And, and Medicare was the way we could pay for the, 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 patient, the, the illness of people that were over 65. Mm -hmm which meant that now that there was payment for people that were aged, there were also people who figured out how to make money that way. Mm -hmm. So by 1980, we had to put in what we called DRGs, Diagnostic Related Groups. Mm -hmm. And Diagnostic Related Groups set a cap on how much money would be paid for a, a different condition. So because people were making money, we had to find a way to stop them from just making money and deliver up the care. Mm -hmm. Years ago, they, they gave aid to people if there was not a man in the house. Mm -hmm. So all the men left the families mm -hmm. so they could get aid to depend the children. That was a good deed to give them money. It was bad to make the men leave the house. Mm -hmm. Now we have to let men come back to the house. Too. So it's like this ongoing thing is you find ways to help people, but then somebody takes advantage of it. And so mm -hmm. working it out so that you're helping but not being abused with that mm -hmm. is 
That's is a good the one. issue. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm always trying to keep that in mind. What mm -hmm. will what will be the problem with that? Just like in the mm -hmm. in the days of old with physical therapy, because they paid for every modality. Every patient got every modality because it was a way to make money, mm -hmm. even if they didn't need it. Mm -hmm. So they had to go to a system of paying for a visit rather than from every modality. Sure. So it's it's this, how will people take advantage of it? What's the good deed? What will be the bad deed? Mm -hmm. That's my new motto. Yeah. Now, it's been said that you're the average of five people <laughs> that you surround yourself with. So for you, who are those five people who influence you the most or who you spend the most amount of time with? It, it, well, actually, because I've had these uh, 60 years in the profession, I, I, I have to really think about it not just at this one moment in time, uh -huh. but as moments through time. Sure. And so, uh, so when I was first in physical therapy school, one of the people that was influential was a woman who was getting her Ph.D., and she taught anatomy, and she was kind of one who challenged you to think, mm -hmm. and I kind of like that. So she was sort of a role model. Mm -hmm. And then the neurologist that I, I told you about who was willing to take me on, Dr. Landau, and uh, he, was sort of, he was sort of a role model on making me think even more, challenging me. And then uh, as, as time passed, I've been very fortunate and the people that I've worked with, like uh, you will know by name, Barbara Norton. Mm -hmm. And I knew Barbara Norton <laughs> when I was an umpire and she played softball. So she was in high school. And then she was a candy striper at the, at the hospital. And I was a physical therapist. Candy a candy striper, striper was like a teenage volunteer that would come oh, into the okay. hospital and work. I see. And so then she ended up in physical therapy and she has one of these critical minds. Mm -hmm. So she loves the details and thinks about the details. I'm a big picture person. Mm -hmm. She's a little, a little, but the balance was really great. Mm -hmm. So we have worked together for more than 50 years. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Nancy, initially Woolsey Bloom, mm -hmm. another incredibly smart person. And we saved her because she was an OT. <laughs> saved her. <laughs> Took her out of OT, got her into PT. Uh -huh. And she a, 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 was a key person in helping to translate Sarmanese into English, mm -hmm. <laughs> helping to spell out the ideas that I was just talking about. And then we attracted more people that also had levels of OCD. <laughs> they were very smart. So I, I, and I'm also just going to Washington University because I, I wanted to be, I didn't think about it at the time, but I wanted to be in an environment where there were students, where there were smart people that was challenging, mm -hmm. and the students would come in and say, well, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. And I'd have to, like, figure out something to say. And then I kind of wanted it to be true, and so <laughs> I kept thinking about sure. it. And so, and the university itself was always so great because it was always a place of, of cooperation and not competitiveness. So when we wanted to start a Ph.D. program in movement science, I had no problem getting top scientists to work with us. So an environment that is stimulating, that you have to raise your level, that attracts people that are the same way, and then people that you're interacting with enough that they want to stay and keep interacting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I feel very fortunate to have learned from of course, you as well as Barb and Nancy, and I mean, uh, I think part of the reason why I, I still tend to think, ask a lot of why questions, and it's because all through PT school, the three years, I mean, it sounds like there's a lot of popular courses in Japan right now about uh, clinical reasoning. That's the name of the seminar, but uh, someone from Japan asked me, did you have a clinical reasoning class in physical therapy school and I said I think my whole three years was clinical <laughs> reasoning I mean Absolutely. they were always teach you guys were always teaching us well why does this happen what what why why all the why questions you know yeah so. I, I know I I think the whole idea that that you have to teach clinical reasoning is great but what is the bottom line of clinical reasoning it should be a diagnosis mm -hmm. to clinical reason and then not know where you're going with it I don't even understand it yeah. There's yeah. nothing magic in clinical reasoning. <laughs> a little bit of a just lighter topic here. Um, 
Any books that you have enjoyed the most? Uh, it could be fiction or nonfiction. Well, actually, I'm very much a nonfiction person. Mm -hmm. I, I really like, uh, I like history. I, I really like, um, um, so like my favorite, I just finished a book about George Washington. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, it was fascinating because I didn't realize what a poor general he was. Mm. <laughs> he didn't win, win many battles, but he had this kind of gestalt about him that inspired people. He had a, a good measured thing. So I, I like the real life stories of people that have had an, an impact. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite authors are like David McCullough, okay. who has written great books about John Adams, uh, about the building of the Brooklyn Bridge, about the Panama Canal, about the building of the train coming over, about Harry Truman, and then Doris Kearns Goodwin, who's also written very interesting historical books uh, okay. uh, about uh, uh, Johnson, our, our president, uh, about, uh, the, uh, about uh, Abraham Lincoln, and the uh, putting together all these different people, okay. and so I, 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 those are the books that I like the most. Yeah. And, and what, what I do is I, what, I walk about four miles, four and a half miles every day, and so I listen to books, audible books. Of course, it's a gadget. It's, it is a gadget. It's a you gadget. have to have a gadget. A gadget. So, <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's a great way to to be learning something while you're exercising something. Four miles a day. That's very good. I know. Yeah, I know. Now, the, 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 does your dog walk with you? Yes. Yes. Sometimes she pulls me, and sometimes she pushes <laughs> me. But yeah, no, she does. All right. Very good. Now, did you play sports growing up? Oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> yes, they thought I'd never grow up because I was playing sports. Mm -hmm. I um, th that was another thing that I uh, my father coached the teams. I uh, so I played. Uh, Softball, I was actually on three teams at one time wow. <laughs> in the summer. And, and in those days, a little person like me could play basketball. And I played basketball on at least two teams. I played volleyball. I never did get started on tennis or individual sports. I was always playing, mm -hmm. uh, I was playing team sports and not individual sports. Mm -hmm. we, we just didn't have tennis around us at mm -hmm. the time. So, right. yeah, 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 all the time. Yeah. And then I was an official. I got paid to officiate games. I was an umpire. Right. I was a referee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was good. Fantastic. Yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah. I think, you know what, I think also uh, that sports helped you to build up an enthusiasm. It was also where I first learned how to have insights about people. Because if you, if you play sports, you really learn a lot about somebody. You see how they react when you lose. You see how they react. Mm. Are, are they cooperative? Do they want all the glory? It, it, I, I just that was sort of my start in like insights into people. Yeah. That it was it was good. It was good physically and it was good mentally. It's good. I, I haven't met too many of my patients uh, in your your same generation that have grown up playing a lot of sports. I'm not sure if uh, girls were given that same kind of opportunity as as boys. No, you know, you, you weren't. I mean, it was it was kind of like, ooh, do you really play sports? But I was very lucky because uh, the, the the girls around me, all of us, were very physically active. And mm -hmm. uh, I went to actually the Catholic school, and they had lots of competitive sports mm -hmm. organized out of your church. Mm -hmm. And then I chose my high school because it had the best gym in the city. Is that right? It's true. Okay. It's totally true. Yeah. So. Yeah, it was an atypical group of people that played sports mm -hmm. at that time. Right. Great. Now, um, where can people find you on the internet or social media? Because I mean, you got you got a big following. Uh, you know, find out where your next course is. I, you know, I haven't done the social media stuff. Everybody tells me I should do it, but I tell you, I can hardly get through my email. I, I just can't even imagine social media. Mm -hmm. It's just like, oh no, I don't want to go there. I, maybe I should, but I'm not going to. Mm -hmm. And so the, the way you find out my schedule is to go on the Washington University uh, website. Uh -huh. And if I hurry up, up to my room and get my schedule on, I just got a memo to, Shirley, please send your schedule. Oh, I see. <laughs> so I put my lecturing schedule on the website for Washington University. Uh -huh. Perfect.
Yeah. Perfect. And I'll, I'll put that uh, on the, the bottom screen, uh, the WashU website and the video. Uh, I, I remember when I first, uh, Shogo and I came up to you when I was a third year student uh, to ask you if you would be able to go to Japan and, and teach mm. your MSI class. And uh, I, it just astonished me. You, you, you pleasantly say, oh, I would love to go. I've never been to Japan. But, you know, my schedule's booked for the next two years. <laughs> oh, so can you years. just wait a little bit? <laughs> oh, it wasn't two years. <laughs> no, no, I remember. You, I it mean, two years, two years. Two years, you were fully booked. Well, I think I was working then, too. <laughs> so anyways, um, just so grateful for all these years that I've gotten to know you. Um, lastly, as, as you know, I'm a big fan of yours, and it would mean a lot to me. Uh, if you could give me and the Nexus Motion staff uh, some words of encouragement on sharing and, and teaching the movement system impairment syndromes. Well, you're doing such a spectacular job. I think I'm learning from you. Oh, please. <laughs> you're on social media. You, I mean, look at this stuff. I mean, <laughs> you've got people all over Japan. Uh, I, I'm trying to take lessons from you. I oh. don't, you, you know... Um, it, it, it goes back to the whole thing. I, I feel so lucky. It's sort of like if you attract people that share the same values, mm -hmm. that understand the same things, that want to help make it better, yeah. and I think sort of that enthusiasm. I, I also, I'm a, I'm a big believer that, that, that stuff of value lasts. Yes. I mean, that's sort of my, my other motto. I'm, I'm never worried about how things are viewed at this time because if they have quality, they'll they'll be out there. Mm -hmm. If you're quality, you will attract people that have quality. Mm -hmm. And the more you have people that assess what you're doing and it holds up, mm -hmm. the, the better off you are. So I think it's the same thing of, I want to understand what I'm doing. I want to do a good job. Mm -hmm. I, I want to meet the rigors of scientific th thinking. I mean, like, you know, we had such fun last night. You brought Chris Powers here and, and, and Chris Powers was like, so suspicious of me. I, I mean, you know, he, he really did. He wanted to, to kind of, uh, he, he wasn't sure what I was about. But, but I liked Chris from the standpoint of if, if, he, if he accepted something, it was because it met his criteria. Mm -hmm. Paula Ludwig, she wasn't going to do something just because I said, Paula, this is the way it should be. It was, did what we were saying meet the criteria for her? To yeah. accept that. So I think this whole thing of having critics that have honest concerns, of meeting those critics, of sharing your enthusiasm, of knowing what you're about. I think what's been so wa wonderful at Washington University is that all of my colleagues, we have this big thing we're all working for. It's a, it's a central goal and everybody's jumping in on the same thing. Yeah. And it's worthwhile or it would have gone away. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's, it's that commitment to honesty, good job, meeting scientific rigor mm -hmm. and sharing your enthusiasm. And then you get wonderful people like these who come out to hear it. I know. I have to thank everybody for coming out too because yeah. it's, uh, it's quite far, as, far ways out. So, yeah. So that's my answer to your question. Well, thank you so much, Shirley. This has been a, a, my first time interviewing someone, but it just feels like we're just having a conversation with my good friend. So thank you so Likewise. much. Thank and you for everything. You've been amazing. Thank you. Thank you.